The teaching of Vedanta was amazing. One aspect where Vedanta teaching differed from a normal uh, offline coaching was the attention teachers gave to our doubts. No matter how many times we asked a doubt, the teachers would patiently clear the doubt every single time. And they made learning a very fantastic experience for us. Well, hi everyone, good evening. Thank you for joining us for another session. Well, in this session, we're going to continue learning about chapter one, nutrition and plants. There is another video on YouTube already, the first part of the session that I did. So if you want to, you can go back and check that video after you see the session, right? Because once you see that session, this session would make a lot, lot more sense. But like my favorite teacher used to say that the best and the most important part about the learning process is basically to revise. So that's exactly what we're going to do before we start today's session. We're going to revise almost everything that we did in the last session. Not the whole thing, but bits and pieces which are very important for us to understand what we learned today. All right. So let's try to understand what are autotrophs. Remember autotrophs, right? Autotrophs, plants, what do plants exactly do? Plants make their dash using dash, right? Plants basically make their own food using simple substances, right? And what are these simple substances that we're talking about? We're talking about water, we're talking about carbon dioxide in the presence of sunlight and chlorophyll, right? Can you guess what do they exactly end up making? They end up making a lot of glucose, carbohydrates, starch, whatever you want to call it, and oxygen. All right, let's try to understand what are heterotrophs. Remember we also talked about heterotrophs, there was a cow which was there in the slide, right? Those exactly are called heterotrophs. Now, heterotrophs cannot make their own dash and rely on dash for their food. Now, heterotrophs actually cannot make their own food and they rely on plants or other animals for their food. So, directly or indirectly, they rely upon plants, right? Because the animals that they eat actually eat plants. So if plants do not exist, they would not be able to eat those animals because the animals would die and then they would die, right? Do you remember that, uh, that for they started the session with the story of a lion who died because all the trees vanished from the jungle? That's exactly what it is. So heterotrophs cannot make their own food and they rely on plants or other animals for their nutrition, right? Now, we also understood a little bit about photosynthesis. Remember, I was discussing about leaves being the kitchen of the plant, right? So this is basically the equation that sums up the entire process of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the process which basically happens in the presence of sunlight and chlorophyll using carbon dioxide and water, which gives us glucose and oxygen. Now, where does exactly carbon dioxide come from? It comes from the air. Remember, we also studied about this um, this stomata, stomata is present in the leaves, right? It basically has guard cells which contract and expand to let the air flow happen. Basically, carbon dioxide comes in and oxygen goes out. And how does water ends up reaching the leaves? It basically ends up reaching the leaves through vessels, which are basically like tiny pipe-like structures which are present inside the stem. So now we know what is the equation of photosynthesis, where do all the ingredients come from in the kitchen of the plant, right? Also, I told you a very, a very slightly important thing, right? That chlorophyll is very important because it helps to trap the sunlight. So if chlorophyll is not present, which is the green pigment, sunlight would not be trapped and plants would not be able to make their own food, right? So let's move on and try to understand a little bit more about different types of nutrition and modes of nutrition, right? This is a, this is a slide that I showed you in the last class as well when I asked you what kind of mode of nutrition do you think that mushrooms follow? right? Do, are they autotropic or heterotropic? Now, this is not the only slide that I showed you. I showed you another slide, this one. Remember when I asked you, what do you think are the yellow uh, plant-like structures, right? Do you, what mode of nutrition do you think they follow? Do you think they create their own food or do you think they rely on other plants or animals for their food? Well, this is exactly what we're going to discuss in today's session. We're going to understand what are some special modes of nutrition which are present other than autotroph and subdivisions of heterotropic nutrition, right? So this plant, the mushroom that we're talking about is basically a sort of heterotroph only, right? But it is a little bit different. Let's try to understand how and so is this, right? So the first mode of nutrition that we're going to study in today's session is called parasitic nutrition. Shabna says, hi, hi Shabna, thank you so much for joining. Uh, parasitic nutrition, the example that you will find in your book is of cascuta. 
Cascuta is basically a parasite. It's a parasitic plant. Okay, now parasitic plants, Cascuta included, does not have chlorophyll, which basically means it does not have that green pigment which is so important to make food, right? Like I told you, if chlorophyll is not there, the plants would not be able to capture sunlight and then of course they would not be able to prepare their own food, right? So it's a parasitic plant, it does not have chlorophyll. So what it basically does is, imagine like this is the host plant, right? And what it does is basically entangles itself alongside the host plant and derives nutrient out of the host plant, right? So it doesn't make its own food, it derives nutrients from an other plant, which is called the host plant, right? So that is basically called the parasitic mode of nutrition. There are a lot of other types of plants which are basically parasitic who cannot prepare their own food, right? But they're not heterotrophs, they're called parasitic nutrition. Let's try to understand another mode of nutrition, something that of course you'll find in your book, right? Insectivorous plants. Now, when I came across them, when I was a kid, I was just like, oh, they are non-vegetarians. Well, <laughs> something like that, right? So these plants are basically the kind of plants who rely on eating small, tiny insects here and there for their nutritional needs, right? So they don't prepare their own food. They eat small, tiny insects, what they do is basically, they have modified parts, as you will see, it's written here. They have modified parts. Now, one thing, one example that I can give you right now is basically of this plant, something that's of course there in your book already. Basically, you will see that the leaf of the plant is modified. So one leaf is acts as the bell, basically the bell jar shaped, and one acts as the lid of the bell jar. So it basically helps to capture the plants, uh, capture the insects inside the bell jar, and then, what exactly happens? Then the digestive juices comes to play, right? The digestive juices, basically ex the plants excrete digestive juices, which helps to kill the plant and then digest the insects, right? Kill the insect and then digest the insect. Cool. So we have uh, traps the small insects. It, it basically relies on small insects for its nutrition. Then it has basically has different modified parts, not just leaves, but it also could have different parts which are modified, which are a little different because its mode of nutrition is insectivorous, right? So we are done with parasitic nutrition, parasitic mode of nutrition, the kind of plants which do not create their own food, but also but rely on other plants for their food. Then we have insectivorous plants, right? Insectivorous plants are basically the kind of plants which rely on small tiny insects for their nutritional needs, right? They again do not create their own food. And they of course have modified parts. Now, I think you all will relate to this, right? Sometimes when we have bread at home and sometimes there might be a slice or two which is left in the packet down below that nobody eats. And sometimes you will see in a week or two if nobody touches it and if it's sometimes in the open, what exactly happens is you get a green gray layer of film on it basically right and i'm pretty sure all of you must have seen it so this is basically a form of fungus that happens on the bread or molded bread as a lot of people call it right this is a form of fungus which grows on dead and decayed right now let's try to understand what exactly what mode of nutrition do this kind of fungus mold or bacteria has right so what do these three things have in common you have uh, mold you have mushrooms and you have bacteria what exactly is common among all of these? What exactly is common is the kind of mode of nutrition that they share, right? Their mode of nutrition is similar. It's called saprotrophic nutrition, right? In this mode of nutrition, organisms basically derive nutrients out of dead and decaying organisms or stuff, right? For example, I say stuff because here you hear the fungus was deriving its nutrient out of the dead and decayed bread, right? So saprotrophic nutrition basically refers to those organisms. Now there is a very specific term, like we use a very specific terms for plants who create their own food. They're called autotrophs. And us who cannot create, their, create our own food, right? And we rely on plants, we are called heterotrophs, right? But also organisms which basically rely on, you know, dead and decaying organ organisms for their nutritional needs are called saprotrophs. Right? They're called saprotrophs. So the fungus that you find on the bread, basically mold or mushrooms that we find, or bacteria, all of them are saprotrophs. They have a saprotrophic mode of nutrition. They depend on dead and decaying organisms for their nutritional needs. Okay. Now here, like I said, here the fungus gets the nutrition from the decaying bread. 
right? So the bread is of course not healthy enough to eat, so you should not eat it. It basically is dead at decaying, so it's basically decomposing and the fungus feeds off that decomposing for its nutritional needs and grows. Right? And fungus basically there are spores all around us. Whenever it finds a very very nice cozy home which is moist and suitable, it basically settles there and starts spreading. Right? So bread is one of those places. Right? So let's recap what we've quickly done. We have done parasitic nutrition, we have done insectivorous plants, insectivorous mode of nutrition, we have also done saprotrophs, which is basically saprotrophic mode of nutrition. Now let's try to understand what kind of nutrition. Oh, before we do that, let's try to understand two concepts which are present in the book and you should ideally know about them, right? Now, the first concept that we're going to be talking about is basically called symbiosis. Now, symbiosis is basically a mutually beneficial relationship between two organisms. I know that sounds like a mouthful and it is. But love, maybe it takes a lot of time, right? But don't get scared. It has a very basic, simple meaning, right? Now, imagine two organisms, right? Two organisms. Um, this is organism A, this is organism B. Now organism A gets some benefit from organism B and or organism B basically gets some benefit from organism A, right? So they're basically mutually beneficial. Basically it's a give and take relationship. I give something to you and you give something back to me. Now a very good and classic example of it is basically lichens. Right? Now lichens basically has two parts. It basically has algae which contains chlorophyll. And all of us know chlorophyll is very important to make food. Without chlorophyll, plants would not be able to carry on photosynthesis, right? So lichens has chlorophyll, which is algae, right? Algae has a lot of chlorophyll in it, it is green in color. And then there is fungus. Fungus basically gives water and minerals and nutrients to the algae to make the food, right? So mutually beneficial relationship. Fungus provides the ingredient, algae makes the food and gives the nutrients, gives some of the nutrients to the fungus to thrive. Right? So that's exactly what symbiosis is. Nothing to be nothing to get scared of. Right? The definition might seem a little heavy, but it's not. Just a mutually beneficial relationship, something that benefits both of the organisms. Right? Lichens is an example that you will find in your book. Right? That's why I mentioned it here because it's very easily relatable. You can relate it, book paroke to mil jayegi. Right? Now let's try to understand the second thing that's mentioned, right? What is the process of recovery of nutrients in plants, right? Now, we are cultivating all the time on the ground, right? And the soil after a point will start losing its nutrients. So what are some ways that nutrients are actually replenished in the plant? Nutrients kaise vapas aate hai in the soil, right? So there are two very basic ways of doing that. First is of course manures and fertilizers, something that we already know about, right? We have seen farmers using manures. Manures is basically an organic material, right? And fertilizers is basically chemicals that they put in the soil so that plants can grow strong and healthy, right? The second thing that happens is a lot more of a natural phenomenon, right? Coffee naturally hota hai. First is more like we deliberately do it, right? So ribo uh, rhizobium. Rhizobium is basically a bacteria. Right? It's basically present in the root of the plant. It basically helps to convert the nitrogen which is in the air in consumable form. When I say consumable form, imagine there is a lot of nitrogen in the air, right? And plants need nitrogen for their growth. Now, plants cannot consume the nitrogen in the same form that it's there in the air around us. So what this rhizobium bacteria does, it helps to convert all that nitrogen into form in which the plant can take it, right? Now this helps to replenish the nitrogen levels in the soil. Now that is another reason why crop rotation is done. That's something that you will learn a little further in the next class, right? That's exactly what we're going to do tomorrow. We'll learn a lot more about crop rotation. So two things, first, first is of course manure and fertilizers that we add to the soil. And then we of course have the bacteria ry uh, rhizobium, which helps to replenish the, nutri uh, the nitrogen levels in the soil, right? Now let's come to what kind of or what mode of nutrition do we follow, right? Now we have talked about plants, we have talked about various kind of animals, we have talked about mushrooms. Now we are also a, we are also kind of animals, right? What kind of nutrition or mode of nutrition do you think we follow, right? There is a very specific word which describes the kind of nutrition, mode of nutrition that we follow as human beings. Holozoic. Holozoic is the mode of nutrition that we follow. 
Now, what does holozoic nutrition mean? It basically means that we take in complex uh, substances and break them down into simple forms, right? In this mode of nutrition, organisms take in complex substances, substances and break it into simpler form. Now, when I say simpler form, we already know one form, right? We already know that plants use very simple things to make their food. They, may, they use carbon dioxide, they use water, sunlight, chlorophyll to make food. Right? But here we are doing the opposite. Right? We, are used, we are taking in complex substances which basically could be glucose, could be starch, could be carbohydrates and basically we are breaking it down into small tiny simpler parts. Right? Simpler substances and that's exactly what we do. That's the mode of nutrition, holozoic nutrition that we follow as human beings. Now, something that, com that's, that comes to my mind when I think about holozoic nutrition is how exactly do we break these very complex big substances right into small tiny substances that our body can use for energy right what exactly is the process that basically takes place for that to happen now for that to happen and for to learn about that we are going to meet for the next session right that's gonna happen tomorrow right so take a deep breath and that is exactly what we're going to talk about we're going to talk about what happens when we're exactly breathing right when we are breathing we're taking in a lot of oxygen i think all of you already know that we breathe in oxygen and give out carbon dioxide right so what exactly happens when we're breathing well not technically breathing but the term exactly for it is called cellular respiration right breathing is more of a physical act so when i inhale and exhale I'm breathing. Like right now you're breathing. Kalpana says hi, hi Kalpana. A little bit late but you can of course watch the recap a little bit later and watch the first session as well if you've missed it. Right? So breathing is more of a physical act when you inhale and you exhale. Right? But cellular respiration is more of a chemical process and we are going to understand how does photosynthesis relates to cellular respiration. That is basically the most important link between plants and animals. How are we related to plants and how this cycle is very important right of the gases exchange and water exchange that happens between us and plants without that it would be very difficult to survive on earth without oxygen or carbon dioxide right which is required by both plants and us so that's exactly what we're going to discuss in the next session which is going to happen tomorrow at six so please be there uh, before I leave you for this session, there is a link for, uh, in the description, there is a link for a PDF, which is basically a tiny exercise that you can do for this session to basically understand if you've understood this session well or not. What you have to do is basically you can cut them out or you can basically just match or write it by yourself. So you basically match the organism with the mode of nutrition and the source of energy, right? Where exactly do they get their energies from? All right. Well, that's exactly it for this today's session. I'm going to see you tomorrow. So please be present if you want to know what exactly happens when we breathe, what exactly is cellular respiration and how, how all of it is connected to photosynthesis and how all of it is so important for us to survive on planet Earth. Thank you so much for joining this session and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.